aren't you? Well, I would like to see him in this, so I'll buy it for him. Well, maybe he doesn't want to wear that, though. Uh -huh. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You're going to be involved in untruthfulness right away. If you accept something like that and keep it and don't say something about it. And that person goes under that delusion that I bought them a good thing. I mean, our lives in this regard have to be transparent. Mm -hmm. I guess if, some, if someone buys you something you don't like, you can always pass it on to someone else. And don't worry about that. That's going to always happen with all of us. Mm -hmm. That's going to always happen. That's not, a, that's not a great shame to experience. You bought something for someone, they really just don't like that. I've had it happen to me. I don't know how many times. I guess the more often you buy something for someone, the more often it will probably happen. The less you know about that person, the more often it will happen as well. It's no big deal. You should be grateful for the person's the thought, they say is what counts anyway, for the person's thought. The person should be grateful for the fact that, well, the, the Lord gave me the provisions to buy this, and if, if they don't like it, well, um, I can keep it or I can perhaps pass it on to someone else. Thank the Lord that most times that doesn't happen in life. I think more often than not, we do get what we would like in life. But again, we have to be sensitive to one another and to one another's needs and desires and wishes. Now, that's a very small area uh, of this whole concept of lying. I guess that's just coming out right now without me intending to say it because it's a practical area, though. And I just wanted to paint a picture here to begin with in our early studies about lying, how it does carry right over into the practical aspects of our life. So you, you meditate on that and you think about that, so especially you husbands and wives, and I guess especially husbands and wives, that you're always doing things for one another. And sometimes you're going to miss it and you're going to do something the other person just doesn't really enjoy. They don't want to take that trip. <laughs> That's the most boring thing. They'd rather be in the beach and you're headed to the mountains. <laughs> well, they, 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 can, they, can, they can let it be known that this is not my favorite thing. But then they can also be a Christian about it and have a good time. See, you've got, you got to work it out. Don't just say, now, to be truthful, I can't even go to the mountains. I just refuse to even go to be truthful about the matter. No, I don't think you've got to go to an, an extreme like that. You could, and maybe it doesn't have, to be, doesn't have to be known. I don't know how the situation would work itself out. And I'm not going to go to every case like that. I'm going to give you the teaching and let you work it out in your own life. Whether something needs to be said, uh, maybe something was given or done in such a way that the person, there's no way they'll live under any delusion if you don't say anything about it. That could happen in some cases. So don't go bring something up just to bring it up if it doesn't need scripturally to be brought up. But again, let's take the going to the mountains or the oceans versus the mountains or whatever. Uh, it could be known that the person doesn't, that's not their favorite place. But still, as a Christian, why can't you enjoy the mountains just as much as the ocean? If you want to make up your mind to do that, you can do that. You can say, this would not have been my pick. It's your pick. It's a great pick. I, for me, it's going to be a great pick. That's the way that we should deal with things like that. Or then we, become all, we all become so persnickety that we just have to live on an island all by ourselves. <laughs> Manufacture our own food and make our own clothes and, and all of that. So I'm not advocating anything like that. I'm just advocating be true to one another. Speak the truth. Do not lie to one another. And you ask your own self, is this a big deal and does it need to be brought up? If I don't bring it up, are 1,500 people really going to be living under delusion about this matter? If not, then maybe I just won't mention anything about it. It's not that big of a deal. Again, you work it out. And I'm sure God looks at our hearts anyway. He's not so concerned that you look at every little single thing you've ever said or done or given and make sure it's in total truthfulness. If he sees that your heart's geared in that area, I'm sure that's what counts. All fallen men partake of this evil fruit. Psalm 58 and verse 3. Just to get back to this before we get into what we want to discuss this morning. Psalm 58, 3. All fallen men partake of this evil fruit. Even from, the bir from birth the wicked go astray, and from the womb they are wayward and they speak lies. Uh, here's a big one. Lying... Lying is the spirit and sin of Antichrist. Mm -hmm. Look at this profound verse in 1 John 2.22. <clears throat> Lying is the spirit 
and the sin of Antichrist. 1 John 2.22 <laughs> Who is the liar? How do you like that question? Who is the liar? Who is the liar? Who is the liar? It's the man who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. I'm sure what John is saying here is here's the epitome of all lies to deny the Son of God. That's the lie that'll damn you forever is to deny him. There are many different liars, but I mean, in its epitome, who is the liar? It's whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. In other words, whoever denies the divinity of Christ, he is the liar of all liars. Such a man is the Antichrist. Well, I'm sure there's going to come one man one day who really fits this verse. But as John has said in, in verse 18, even now, many Antichrists have come. So there are many Antichrists who would deny that Jesus is the Christ. And so such a man is the Antichrist, and he denies the Father and the Son. Now, I don't intend to provide you with all of the various Hebrew and Greek terms for this study or where they occur because the material, like I've said before, is rather vast. <coughs> but I, I think it's better that we understand this significant topic um, by taking another route, which, as I've described before, is to look at the boundaries of clarification. But there are three important terms, the chief ones used in the Old Testament and, and in the New, and uh, I think I'll, I'll give these to you. Uh, first of all, we have the Hebrew term sheker, sheker, S-H-E-Q-E-R, uh, sheker, and then we have kazav, those are the two chief Hebrew terms that are used, now many others are used and translated many different ways. I mean, in King James there in Psalm 4 and verse 2, we saw leasing. So if we read all the references, we'd find falsehoods and deceits and, and lies and wickedness and perverseness and leasing and just about everything that would um, uh, be difficult to go through all of those. So we have sheker and kazav, K-A-Z-A-V. The chief term in the New Testament is pseudos, P-S. Uh, e U D O S, pseudos. And pseudos, with many other words in the New Testament, is made into a compound word. It means false. You could add it on to many things. False Christ, pseudos Christos. You'd have a false Christ then. So, their meaning is falsehood or deceit. Would be a good way to describe all three of these. Shaker, Kazaz, and Pseudos. Their meaning is falsehood or deceit. <coughs> now, let's go into our definition of a lie. And let's begin with your brilliant ones, first of all. What do we have for definition of a lie? You people are supposed to have worked on that a little bit. Who wants to volunteer theirs? Let's hear several people's if several have theirs done. A good one sentence definition of a lie. Here's our first one. Okay, why don't you give all that to us again? That's good. Let's listen to that again. Read it all again. Willingly and knowingly. Willingly and knowingly. 
giving a false testimony on any given matter or to withhold information that will cause someone else to be misinformed or okay. misled. Okay, let's stop right there for a minute. Okay, he's saying willingly or knowingly giving a false testimony about any matter. That'd be an active form of it. And then uh, a passive form would be withholding information that someone needs to form a correct evaluation about something and for you to withhold that would intend some deceit on your part to them, okay? Um, and then to, to act as a deceiver or to speak or act different than what your conscience knows to be the truth. I, uh, I just uh, more or less wanted to define it more by just our own, from our own beings. Our, I believe that we as individuals know at times whether or not we're telling the truth, even though you can't uh, give, an, give a, a explanation of what, what the truth of the situation is, but your conscience knows what's right or wrong <coughs> in that situation. Okay. Not the same. Your conscience knows what is right, and you go against that, then you're lying to okay. yourself, anyways. So we've got speaking and acting. Do we have anything about thinking in the, any of those definitions there? I guess conscience, where I mentioned. Uh, okay, that would be your, your thinking. Your thinking that you know what, you know, your conscience knows what the truth is, and you go against that. Okay. Someone else's definition then. No one's got another one worked up? <laughs> Pardon? That was, that was a good one, he said. So yours, should have given yours first then. <laughs> um, I, mine's in fragments. I just came across. Deception by, deception by word or action that misleads or misinforms another. And then a second one, not the truth. Word or action counter to God's word and spiritual reality as well as phenomenal. And then uh, a misrepresentation of God in, in doctrine or deed. Okay, so that applies to several different areas then. Okay, anyone else want to venture yours? This becomes important just formulating this. I wanted to hear some of yours so I wouldn't have to bring various dictionary definitions. Remember we did that on love. I read you various definitions so you could hear it from different angles and different people's approaches and different slants of it. That's basically why, and I wanted you to also think about it. Um, the definition is fairly important because even it in itself sets certain boundaries of clarification. Uh, yours started off willingly and knowingly were those two early words. Okay, willingly and knowingly. Now, now what that implies then is, is you could tell someone something that was just off the wall wrong. And if you didn't know that it was wrong, in other words, you'd be innocent by ignorance. If you didn't know that it was wrong, you haven't lied to the person. You haven't lied to anyone. Even if it was just off the wall wrong, you didn't tell a, li a lie to a person. Um, uh, and I think it came forth, I think, from the same person about uh, misrepresentation. I think I told you before that Dr. Freeman has a tape on this. That's the one, that's my source for the whole title of my paper, The Anatomy of a Lie. And that's what got me probably 10 years ago thinking about this whole thing of lying and I've come a lot further since then since I've had to work on it myself that was just one message that uh, really said that it's all right also to not tell the truth sometimes although they would never realize that because they just didn't go deeply enough into their study but you know let's let's take a case um, um, Okay, you've been, you've been really busy. You had a lot of things to do that day. I mean, you had a lot of things to do, and, and you're person A. And person B knew that you had a lot of things to do that day. And so whenever they see you that night, they say to you, 
well, did you get such and such done today? And you look at them and say, oh, sure. Now, now what, what does that mean whenever you, in that context, what does that mean when you say, oh, sure? Are you saying, I surely did get that done? No, what you're saying, you're saying something, what you, but what you mean by that is just the opposite then. Oh, sure, I got that done. Like, of course I didn't get that done. I had a lot to do today. Well, now, see, there's another, there's a, an example of something that's spoken right there. It's, it's done willingly, it's done knowingly. Um, but is it done with the intent to deceive? There we have to fill out the end of the definition, the end of the statement there. Here's a definition we're going to work with. What is, what is a lie? <coughs> a lie is the intentional, willful violation of the truth in thought, word, or deed. Definitions are hard to work up, but generally they're short. It's whenever we don't use broad enough terms, we have to use many terms to include many different branches of it. But a definition like this is broad enough that it will include everything without using, you know, various terms. Like our second example here, wanted to go into, you know, uh, false teaching or um, the Bible or God's truth or something. Well, it can all be summed up in this. It's the intentional, willful violation of the truth in thought, word, or deed. The intentional, willful violation of the truth in thought, word, or deed. Now we have thought, word, and deed because those are three important areas there. Thinking, speaking, and living a lot. Thinking, speaking, and doing a lot. It's something said or done that's calculated to deceive. It's something said or done calculated to mislead. The most well-known form is the spoken form. All right, and it's spoken form. Here's what a lie is. A statement of what you know to be false with the intention of deceit. Now, if it doesn't fit that definition, it's not a spoken lie. That's going to be our argument. We're going to build our case upon this definition. A statement, since this is the most popular form of the lie, I didn't say the, the most um, common form, but popular in people's thinking, let's define it. A spoken lie is a statement of what you know to be false with the intention of deceit. give you any good example here judges 16 verses 6 and 7 Delilah said to Samson tell me I pray thee wherein thy great strength lieth and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee and Samson said unto her if they bind me with seven green withs that were never dried then shall I be weak and be as another man. That's a statement. The speaker, Samson, knows it to be false. His strength, he knows, is in the hair, not in what he's bound with. It's given with the intention of deceiving Delilah. It's a classic example of a lie, of a spoken lie. And, of course, that's found throughout human history and it's found throughout Scripture. Uh, let me qualify that last statement. You've got to think a while to really find a good blatant three-step spoken lie in scripture just the concept is found many times you know um, God hates lying God hates deceit that's found but to find a good three-step example um, those are kind of hard to come by a whole basket full of those but here's a classic three-step one uh, the, the uh, speaker makes a statement that he knows he makes a statement he knows it to be false and he makes it with the intention of deceit it's spoken um, the speaker and the hearer have two different conceptions of the communication between them I'll show you how all this works out philosophically later on as we get when we get person 
B over here for you and person A over here. We have a phone link between them. And he does the speaking and he does the listening. And what is spoken and what is heard is the communication that goes in between. And he says something on this communication line, and he thinks one thing about what's said. This person's over here. He hears the same information that this person spoke, but he thinks another thing about the communication there. The whole thing was the communication there. It was a communication. Uh, the communication was the same for both, but still somehow by the time you got from person A to person B, we have a false conception that doesn't line up with what was in person A's mind. And that's another thing of helping us clarify and define what this lie is. That's the most popular form. What would you say is the most common form of lying? Probably through deed. Mm -hmm. Probably through action is the most common form of lying. Lying is not a misinformed or an ill-informed declaration. <coughs> you tell someone that Brother Ross said this, you don't have any intention of deceit, you, you are honestly trying to pass the information along as you thought that it was said, but I didn't say that. You're not guilty of lying. You have misrepresented me, but their misrepresentation is not synonymous with lying. Lying has to be willful, it has to be intentional, and it has to be given um, basically, basically with the intent of deceit. So if it's a violation of the truth, I didn't put that in my definition here, but if it's a violation of the truth, it, it is done with intention to deceive them. Even if the person is so deceived into thinking that what he says is actually true, well, he's still living in deceit himself. It's the intentional, willful violation of the truth and fault, word, or deed. You could even add on to that if you didn't see it in the word truth with the intention of deceit. So it's not misinformed or ill-informed declarations that are made. You just didn't have all the facts. Now, again, if you're just trying to be, you know, a gossip or you're just trying to go spread some rumor real quickly and you don't stay around long enough to get some of the facts, well, I think that would probably be wrong. I don't know that we would call it a lie. We'd probably have to put it under some other sin or some other category. That would be wrong, though. And if in any way you're trying to misrepresent me, that would be a lie. Or misrepresent anyone, that would be a lie. But if you simply and honestly have the facts confused in your mind and you go tell someone that, then don't think you have to repent for lying. It's not misinformed or ill-informed declarations. It's not a so-called honest mistake. We all make that. I thought this person said that. I thought they meant this. And I went and told someone else about it. It was an honest mistake. Now, God is the judge and the trier of our hearts. He knows whether it's an honest mistake or whether there really is, underneath the surface, uh, some measure of intent to deceive. He will know that. But assuming that, it's, that there is no intent to deceive, then an honest mistake is just that, a mistake that's done honestly. But a lie is intentional deception and falsehood that may be planned or not planned. It may come with, with much forethought or little forethought, so-called spur of the moment. Let's go and read some more together. <clears throat> Second page in the paper, I've read you the first two paragraphs so far. This will clarify a little more of this. Let's go into the bottom of page two in the third paragraph. <clears throat> Pilate once made the embarrassingly stupid mistake of asking Jesus, perhaps rhetorically, what is truth? John 18, 38. For a Christian, the incredible irony lies in the fact that Pilate spoke while beholding the perfection of truth incarnate. The God who cannot lie, Titus 1-2, a footnote, see also Numbers 23-19, 1 Samuel 
15:29, which is a verse I haven't given you. You might want to mark down. 1 Samuel 15:29 and Hebrews 6:18. The God who cannot lie, who cannot deny himself, 2 Timothy 2.13, all of whose works are done in verity, Psalm 111 and verse 7, in whom dwells no darkness, 1 John 1.5, and with whom there is no variableness, no variableness, neither shadow of turning, James 1.17, stood in the person of Jesus Christ, the God-man, and Pilate made the blunder of asking what is truth. Because he was unregenerate, he could not hope to know the essence of truth. But as Christians, we stand under no such cloak of excuse. But do we really grasp what the doctrine of truth is as it relates to our practical life? The question that must really be addressed is the sister query of Pilate's, what is a lie? He asks the question, what is the truth? What is truth? The question we really need to ask is, what is a lie? God is displeased with his people when they walk in any other fashion than that of Christ Jesus, our perfect example, 1 Peter 2.21. Jesus never lied to anyone. He never misled, tricked, deluded, or deceived the people. The innocent Lamb of God lived in a wicked world of dissimulation without a single blemish of hypocrisy. And we are called to imitate our Lord. But how often are Christians trapped in what are thought by some, and we could say many, even evangelical Christians, to be lies of expediency based on our culture? To the hostess question, did you enjoy the meal? One responds, absolutely. It was the most delicious meal I have had, when in fact the soles on most boots taste better. Well, the frightened secretary lies about her boss's presence in the office because he insists that he is not in. Is her paycheck the only matter about which she is to be concerned? As people pass by the pastor on their way out of the Sunday morning service and he asks, how are you today? Most respond, very well, thank you. The fact of the matter is, their body is racked with pain and straying youngsters are causing great emotional pain. Bills are continually piling up while the husband is unemployed and the sermon was just as stale as last week's. Perhaps they just believe in positive confession. The medical lie is another frequent one. Some... T <laughs> well, I think how many times a pastor says, how are you? They, very well. And then Mrs. Jones comes in, very well. And that's not true. You are not doing very well. So I said, perhaps they just believe in a good confession then. The medical lie... Although I, I don't think that's the case. I think that just is the cultural, social thing to do. It's just say very well. You don't want to put your burdens on someone else. So you lie to them. <laughs> the medical lie is another frequent one. Some doctors will not allow the state of a terminally ill patient to be made known to them by visiting friends or relatives. Strict commands known as doctor's orders are given before admission to the room is granted. Humanitarian humanitarian reasoning, howbeit fallen, forces the doctor to think that the truth is not an option of discussion while in the presence of the patient. Some other topic must be picked. But what if this, this man does not know Jesus Christ as personal Savior? Sometimes it takes a traumatic episode to place an individual in the role where he may at least be willing to discuss his eternal future. And if you don't let him know he's going to be pushing up daisies next week, he's not going to talk about religion with you. If he knows that he is, he may talk. May the doctor's commands come before the Lord, who said to preach the gospel to every creature? Are we to encourage the man's false hope of temporary life in place of discussing the real horror of his eternal death? If he assumes that his hospital stay is but a brief one, for he will shortly be on his feet again, he may never be honest with himself about his rejection of the Messiah. In this last case, I do not mean to imply that the proof of one's commitment to Christ may only be seen in how crudely you inform a person of his imminent death. There are diplomatic ways to broach such a topic, but lying is not one of them. The coin of vantage belongs to the hospital visitor. Christ, in all cases, spoke only what was true, and we must do the same. In this paper, I would like to basically set forth the anatomy of the sin of lying by first defining the concept, which is what we're on this morning. Then, 
reviewing the alleged examples in the Bible of the so-called justified lie and the necessary boundaries of clarification for discussing a right truthfulness and deception, which will be the, heat, the meat of our heated discussion. And finally, turning our attention to the serious present and future consequences of untruthfulness, which will be the third and wrapping up thing that we'll study. Definition. A lie is the intentional, willful violation of the truth in thought, word, or deed, which is calculated to deceive. Well, I attach that on here, so maybe that, that would be best. It is not just a misinformed or ill-informed honest mistake, but rather it, it is intentional deception. Much thought may go into the act of lying, or relatively little, if it comes on the spur of the moment. The most well-known lying is that which is spoken, a statement of what you know to be false with the intention of deceit, Judges 16, 6 to 7. But the case may be that deceit in action is actually more common in people's lives. For instance, the teenage girl who has been dropped by her former boyfriend in favor of another girl may be broken-hearted, but to be seen by him at a school dance in this state is just beneath her dignity. What does she do? When he, her former boyfriend, enters the room, she immediately jumps to her free feet, grabs the closest young man to dance, and pretends she is having the time of her life. Thus we see that lying is much more complicated than simply calling black white and white black. It is the gray area where many people run into problems of clarification.